So now let's turn to the contemporary period. How do nationalist and far-right groups deal with Europe? Conventionally, it has been always the analysis, the understanding that these groups are Eurosceptics, that they reject European integration. And indeed, far-right parties basically since the beginning of the European integration project in the 1950s and the emergence of such parties in earnest really in the 1970s and 80s have been rejecting European integration. Instead, they've proposed a Europe of fatherlands or a Europe of nations, but often not based on supranational integration and cooperation as we see it in the European integration project. But in recent years, there's been a shift. Nationalists across Europe have been appropriating the idea of Europe for themselves. From Pegida in East Germany, a protest movement which called itself the Patriotic Europeans against the Islamification of the Occident, where in fact you see Europeans as a central figure, not Germans, not East Germans from a particular town, but rather Europeans. To the Identitarian Movement, which is a pan-European far-right movement, to far-right European political parties from Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National to Salvini's um, Lega and the FPÖ and AfD in Austria and Germany, we've seen cooperation, for example, in a gathering called the Patriotic Spring, which took place in the several European cities of far-right parties after 2016, emphasizes their European orientation. So they have, in many ways, discovered Europe as a theme. This is well embodied by a speech which Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban gave in 2020 in February, where he said, we also learned that Europe is not in Brussels. Europe is us, and we do not have to measure up to the tired Brussels elite who will soon be disillusioned even with themselves. We used to think that Europe was our future. Today, we know that we are the future of Europe. So what you can see here is rejecting Brussels, yes, European integration as it is known, but these political parties and movements claim Europe for themselves. And what are the themes in which they are doing that? Well, first of all, they are pan-European content themes. For example, the uh, far right-wing conspiracy theory of the so-called Great Replacement, the idea that European population is supposed to be replaced by migrants uh, through a nefarious plan of elites. Then there is pan-European communication. There are similar slogans. There are even linguistic combinations, Bulgarian protest movements talking about Merkel muss weg or Serbian protests having slogans such as you will not replace us. So you find even a language which crosses boundaries. There's also a pan-European framing. These movements, parties, often present themselves as speaking for Europeans rather than for their own electorate, for their nations. So how come? Well, it has, I think, one essential foundation, and namely, that is the idea that there is a common other. As I was saying in an earlier unit, the other is an essential part of any identity construction, also European identity. And here again, we find the other being Islam or migrants, in particular in the context of the migration uh, and the refugees fleeing uh, to Europe uh, during the peak period of 2015-2016 through the Balkans and the Mediterranean. And in the aftermath, we find uh, redefining and reclaiming Europe as uh, a, a project which the far right can claim for itself. In fact, Rogers Brubaker, an American sociologist, has called it civilizationism the idea of a shared civilization, uh, and he defines it as an identitarian Christianism, a secular posture, a philo-Semitic stance, and ostensibly liberal defense of gender equality, gay rights, and freedom of speech. So the idea that Europe is defined by a mixture of identity and values and defined against another. Now, this allows for also an inclusion of Central and Eastern Europe, which after 1989 often presented itself uh, and nationalist movements there as returning to Europe after Soviet rule. And in Southeastern Europe, which uh, where national movements often define themselves as the bulwark of Europe, namely the defense against the Ottomans and against Islam. So these different understandings of Europe find space in this common narrative. But 
there are tensions. So it is not to assume that this idea of Europe is without in inherent conflicts. First of all, these political movements and parties are uh, often fragmented and have a hard time to cooperate with one another. They often worry about associating with one another in the fear that they might be perceived as being too radical or too fringe. They also have competing claims. So when, for example, Marine Le Pen dismissed the new Franco-German treaty, suggesting that it opened the door to the annexation of Alsace by Germany, this is certainly not in line with the thinking of far-right parties in Germany. They are also divided in how Europe is defined. In many far-right movements in the West of Europe, we find, in fact, the notion that they are defending Europe as a secular project, one which also in includes gender equality and the rights of LGBTQ communities, because that is their understanding of Europe and a way to uh, prove the superiority to other religions and regions, while in Central and Southeastern and Eastern Europe, we often find the rejection of these notions of secularism and gender equality. So there are many inherent tensions in this idea of Europe, but it does raise the question whether or not the notion of Eurosceptic or of anti-European is really useful in understanding far-right-wing and nationalist parties today.